afternoon, everybody online, everybody in the room. Welcome to the Read Research Notes seminar for today. My name's Beck, and I'm going to be um, stepping in for Kat and Reedy to host. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge that in the room here, we're on Ngunnawal land, land that was um, never ceded to the Crown, although you might think otherwise, looking at the session over the death of the Queen in the media at the moment. Um, and for those of you who are joining online, I hope that you can take a moment to think about whose lands you're on while we're coming together today. So it's a great pleasure for me to be introducing my valued colleague, Dr. Robin Gulliver, who's going to be talking about the activities of activities and impacts of the Australian oh, environmental yeah, movement, just the whole thing <laughs> about the Australian environmental movement. Um, Robin and I are working together on some research that's kind of looking at how it is that people who are advocating for action on climate change, who are coming at climate change from a position that's different from your kind of quintessential environmentalist, how they might have an impact on what a bunch of other folks think about it. So we're just kind of getting started working on that, but of course that's brought Robin into the read department. So for those of you in read, you might be seeing Robin for the first time. Robin's with us for the next three years, so I hope you'll all have a chance to meet and say hello and learn from some of the incredible research Robin does. So I've admired Robin and her research for quite a while since I first became aware of Robin and her research. So Robin's just published prolifically um, since, when did you start your PhD? Was that 20, uh, 2017? 2017, yeah. yeah. So just a couple of years ago, already finished, um, written, edited books, published a handful of papers, lots of different methods, looking at online content analyses, survey quantitative type work, interview type work as well. Um, and Robin also comes at this space with a background in environmental activism herself. So a really valuable and unique mix of um, practical experience and academic wisdom. So I'll hand over to Robin, who's going to talk to us for about the next half hour or so. And Robin, I think is happy to take questions throughout the talk. That's right, because um, as you'll see, I'll go over different topics. And if you're anything like me, I forget what I was going to ask on the previous topic by the time we get to the second topic. So feel free to put your hand up or put a comment in the chat. Um, I'll try to keep my eye on the chat. If you do ask a question in the room, can you take your mask off? Because I have severe hearing loss and I can't hear anything with the mask on. But yes. Thank you, Robin. Sorry, right. over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here and also the land in which I've done most of my work, which is Kwandamuka country up in the Moreton Bay region of Brisbane. And Kwandamuka people are doing incredible work looking after Strip of Island, Moreton Island, and also bringing up new leaders to bring First Nations perspectives both to Australian social uh, context but also to the environmental movement. So today, I am going to talk about a lot of things, but the first thing I want to start with is, you might just need to click mm. on the slides, sorry. It's, I think Zoom is selected, should back now. Excellent. Yeah. What does the environmental movement have to do with me? And I wanted to start with this because I have looked at on the website about what the um, R.E.M.D. school covers and we do amazing things. And I wanted just to know that the environmental movement really can have a lot of impact on the stuff you research in the school. Now it's important to resource, uh, resource environment and development because the movement is a really powerful counterbalance, especially to extractivism, so the um, extraction and use of resources and also in Australia often for development. Um, so building development. The movement, as we'll see, involves lots and lots of people. It's a primary driver of social change and most of it remains hidden. And that is the goal of my research, which is an empirical focus on the movement. So I'm going to look at six things, which is why I'm happy to ask a question after each one. <laughs> so the first one, what is the movement? Then the groups and the activities, the networks, the outcomes, and the next steps. So I'm going to start off really quickly by explaining what the terms are that I want to use. So the first thing is advocacy. When you engage in trying to change people's behaviours or attitudes, you are engaging in advocacy and it is a crucial component of being in the environmental movement. The other element is engaging in that advocacy on a collective basis. So you identify yourself as someone who is an activist or as an environmentalist or is in some way doing something for the environment and engaging in advocacy. Now these things together create what we call the movement. And there's three primary characteristics. You have that shared identity, 
You might not call yourself an activist, it's a very contentious term, but you have a shared identity as having something to do with trying to create environmental change. In some way, you're in a network and you're also engaging in collective action. So that's a big thing. It's really hard to put boundaries around what the movement is. And often, depending on what discipline you come from, you might have different terms that you associate with the movement. So for example, when I read a lot of stuff about political science, they often use the term protest when they're talking about the movement. And in other terms like sociology, they might use terms such as um, NGOs. They might simply refer to NGO action. What I look at is everything possible to study in the movement, because why limit yourself? I mean, there's a lot going on. So there's lots of ways we can get data on the movement to find out what's going on. We can, for example, look at the people in the movement, their characteristics, the groups, the actions they do, so that's events and tactics, we'll talk about that in a bit, how they message what they're doing, where they message it, what their values are, the issues, and the resources they need, such as money and staff. You can also look at how their audience who they're communicating to, how that audience responds. The audience could be you and I, the public, it could be the media, it's often the media that disseminates the messages of the environmental movement, or it could be policymakers. And then a particular interest for me is how the targets of their active advocacy respond. Corporate targets, political targets, and the public. The first thing I'm gonna cover quickly is groups. So this is the environmental movement. First of all, you can have a lot of groups. There's the characteristics of those groups. They can be formal, which means they have charitable status, or they might just be a bunch of volunteers. Some of them are big. The vast majority are tiny groups of just a few people, maybe up to 10 people. Some of them have staff. The vast majority of groups are all volunteers. Those groups primarily engage in campaigns. They may not always call it a campaign. Sometimes they call it just a thing that they do, or they just activism. But those campaigns have an issue. So it might be about coal mining, for example. They have a target, which could be, say, a Dani coal mine, right? That's the target. They want a Dani corporation to stop doing that coal mine. And that is also, of course, the goal, what they want to achieve. They do their campaigns through events, which you can also call tactics, actions, and collective actions. And these have a bit of a spectrum, and it's really blurry on the spectrum, but you can go here from private environmental behaviors. Uh, which are generally not collective in nature. So by and large, I don't research private environmental behaviours, except to the extent that some environmental groups actually ask people to do them. Normative, that means actions that are norm, the norm in the society that we live in. So here in Australia, uh, doing a rally is quite normative. You're allowed to do it. Last year, I was a postdoc at the University of Hong Kong. Doing a rally in Hong Kong, is non-normative, so it is against the norms, that's legal in that country, and then you can go from non-normative, illegal actions, to violent ones. By and large, in Australia, there is almost no violent collective action, unless you bring in, say, violence to property, which might be, if you're going to chain yourself to a bulldozer, you might consider that a violent action. That's the only time that happens. So, here's our first data about groups. Now, I think my primary goal here is to show you that when you look at the movement from an empirical nature, you realize how incredibly vast it is. So this is just 500 groups that I did in my PhD, the 500 groups that engage in advocacy. There are thousands of other groups that also do engage in advocacy, but they don't say it on their website. So what I did was I did a bit of a snowball network analysis to get all these groups. I scraped all their websites. And I look to see which ones say they do campaign or advocacy. And then I look to see what they look at. You can see that early on, 1883 was the first study that I found. And all the way through here, groups are primarily focused on conservation. So, you know, saving some birds or preserving land in Tasmania, things like that. And then you have this big growth in the climate groups um, from around 2006, which happens to correspond with our boards. <coughs> Excuse me, inconvenient trends. Where are the groups? Well, they're predominantly, unsurprisingly, based on the uh, east coast of Australia. Some of them, the circles here refer to how far they actually cover the country. The majority, or almost the majority of the groups, actually just look at a local level. So they're just Canberra Climate Action now. They just look at Canberra, and that's all they do. There's across those 497 groups, in one year, they did 900 
and 61 campaigns. So that may be a surprise because that's a lot of campaigns. Um, and only 17% of them at that time were focused on climate change. So what I wanted to do as well is I wanted to look at what they are asking for in their activism, right? Remember a critical part of being part of the environmental movement is that you're advocating for something you want to change. So this was done with topic modeling on the 114 websites of the groups that focus exclusively or predominantly on climate change. And it's a pretty cool R package that enables you to look at all the words within the words in a sentence and see what the topics are that come out. The, primary, uh, the most important topic that people were focusing on was mining and coal mining. At that time in 2017, unsurprising again, because that is when we had to focus on the Stop It Only campaign. The next most prominent messaging or topics that these groups used was health. Um, and that was also because it kind of corresponded with some health related groups like Doctors for Climate Action, uh, Emerging Doctors for the Environment, uh, and then we had Finance and Reef. This one's a little bit hard to explain, so I'll just do it quickly, but what you can do is look at all the words on a website and compare them with all the words we use across multiple genres, and that's called like a dictionary. It's some software that's created in the US. And what we can do is look at the environmental group words and see how they compare with the normal words that we use in this text. And we know from social psychology, collective action, that there's some psychological drivers that make it more likely that people will engage in collective action. And they are your identification, your emotions, usually negative, and your collective efficacy. And what we see when we look at the words in the website is that groups by and large use lots of these social identity words. So like if I was Robin's Awesome Climate Action Group, I would be saying we should do Robin's Awesome stuff, right? We should do it together, us, and do our thing. A lot of those words. There was way less emotional words. And there was lots of words showing power and achievement, things like that. What this kind of shows in a nutshell is that even though we think of activists often as being highly emotional, and we know that emotions are really important for activism, on websites, Groups deliberately try not to convey emotional language. Why might that be? Probably because of a stereotype against emotional activists. Uh, the last thing here is looking at some images, and I'm hopeful on Beck's um, discovery project, Beck's discovery project, that we can also look at how images are presented on websites <laughs> um, for these unconventional or non-stereotypical activists. So we, we set these pictures up for ages, oh my gosh, and we compared whether people would be more likely to do, uh, show intentions to engage in coal mining protest behaviours if they saw those pictures or no picture at all on a fly about the campaign. And, and then it didn't really matter what the picture was, you just have to have a picture. So we found a significant pathway that if there was a picture that, just, that showed descriptive norms, like people, do go on a meeting. There are people that do this stuff. So rather than having a picture of most people, then people feel more efficacious about the campaign and they're more likely to intend to then join it and do stuff. But the only other thing that really mattered for behaviour was whether they already identified as an environmental activist. So I'm really looking forward to doing more research about intentions and behaviour because we can see that actually um, they're vastly different. The things that predict behavior are extremely different from the things that predict intentions and the huge majority of research is on intentions. Uh, last thing I think on this one was we looked at how the media respond to collective action. What we've got here is um, the 10 days of media coverage of the Extinction Rebellion protests and 10 days of coverage of the school strike, hard to see that that was the school strike. And you can see the coverage from Extinction Rebellion, unsurprisingly, was the sentiment very negative, some really horrific media coverage using very um, derogatory terms about activists through extension of that. Far, far less co negative coverage on the school strike for climate, and, um, and actually quite a lot of occasional pockets of positive coverage there as well. So it kind of shows that it's important not to filter our research understanding of activism through the lens of the media, because the media does not report on it in an unbiased way. So next step, this is Bex, from Bex's discovery project. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we'll be working on these cool things about the identity and how people respond to messages from those people who are unconventional. And I also have some other work I'm doing on volunteer leaders and the dynamics of groups that tend to often be really great for a while, they explode and lots of conflict and things like that. And given that the majority of the environmental movement is volunteer based, I think it's really fascinating. Okay, activity. So I've said before, I think sometimes what we think of when we think of the movement is we think of protest. And that is because it's really image friendly, right? It's media friendly, it's kind of gets the clicks if you like. But actually, that is a minority of what the movement does. So this data is from 36,000 events that I scraped off Facebook. From those 500, no, we had 728 groups at that point. And I grouped them into five different types. Civil resistance is a value, tree planting, ego activity, information sharing, etc. etc. And what we see is the majority of the events are information sharing. So it's like something like this. I'm sharing information with you. Could be candidates forum, could be doing a film screening. Um, the civil resistance stuff for rally type of is actually quite a minority, and it picked here, we'll talk about it at the moment. So I really want a take home from this is to point out. If you want to study the environmental movement, look at all the things they're doing, not just the protests. So what do these groups do in terms of beyond the tactics? This is from some interview data, and I asked people, how do they think change happens? These were from environmental leaders, leaders of volunteer groups. And what do you actually think your group do, does, and why do you do it to create change? And surprisingly, again, direct action, which is the sort of the balance of civil resistance, very few of those people thought that that actually leads to change. So what we must be leads to change is collaborating with others. So that's the people power that we're keeping part of the movement. And over here, very quickly, I just wanted to show you that these are all campaigns here. And these are the groups that they target, political targets, individuals, business, or lots of campaigns that actually don't state who they're targeting. And the most common target is political targets, but actually, Lots of businesses are targeted as well. So again, my take home point from this is that the environmental movement does not just target political change. More and more it's targeting business change actually. And it's also really complex sometimes working out what they want from these campaigns because lots of the campaigns do not state who they want to make the change. <laughs> so how tactics are changing? Remember that graph before showed a bit of a boost in civil resistance? Here it is here. So 2019, a little bit of 2018, these are climate groups. These are just conservation and sustainability groups. Massive peak. So those are the 2019 pre pandemic um, projects. And again, extinction rebellion, which came in 2018, 2019. So that's a kind of a radical change in the types of tactics that we do. Um, and also, I just wanted to point out a cool thing about the movement is that the tactics relate to the target as well. Now, this is a Stop Adani campaign. And sure, the Stop Adani campaign obviously targets the Adani Corporation. But what we have is this idea of a primary and secondary target. So here is a primary target, the Adani. These are all civil resistance actions done against those targets over time. So the whole time we've had a low, very low line number of targets or actions against the Dharma. But look at how many actions we have against banks, right? So it's a big four banks, they were asking them to stop fund the Dharma. And why did it drop off? Because they all committed at that point to not fund the Dharma. So the campaign moved on to contractors. They targeted Dharma and um, Acom, things like that, uh, asked them to not work for Dharma. They were committed by March to not work for Dani, and then we had infrastructure for others. Now, this is important to note because the campaign as a whole has failed. The coal mine has started. But look at the levels of success that were occurring within that larger campaign. That's really important when we come to measure the outcomes of environmental action. Next steps on that. So, um, we have on the the online tactics database. These are sorts of online actions, that's what they look like launch pilot for this new campaign on Thursday. And then also, I would love to track these events against the campaign's workout outcome. 
but that is a massive complicated job. So when people ask me what works with environmental activism, they always want to know whether a tactic works rather than a campaign. So, you know, they want to know, does having a rally, will it work, will it change things? But of course the rally is just one thing of many in that campaign. So I want to try to connect them, but it's really hard to do. Anybody wants to join me on that? Yes. <laughs> Networks. So, uh, remember the working with others were seen by environmental volunteer leaders as a really important part of their strategy for creating change. What we've done at this point is look to see, well, who do NGOs, NGOs actually work with? Now, it's a bit of a massive blog here because there's 7,700 groups in that network, and the purple are the NGOs. You can see that 20% of them say they work with businesses. Now, important thing to note is that none of those NGOs that work with businesses do any type of direct action. There are no connections that I saw between businesses and NGOs that work in direct action with civil resistance. So businesses support groups that might support or might advocate for private pro-environmental behaviors like um, not using plastic. You know, if I'm a company and I'm trying to sell reusable food wraps, of course, I could go and say I'll sponsor this environmental group that's actually advocating for no plastic. Um, so it's kind of showing that there is a relationship with business and environmental movement, but only on the kind of nicer spheres of action. What about campaigns? Do these groups work on campaigns together? Well, at this point, um, I'm now going to swell to 1,400 campaigns. So it just keeps getting bigger. And I wanted to know which groups said they work on which campaigns. Um, the blue are the campaigns, and pink are the groups. The size of the circle indicates how many of those groups work with other groups. So that big pink one up there, I think that was ACF, that works with heaps of other groups. But you can see that hardly any of these groups work on campaigns together. I actually think there was only maybe 15 campaigns out of 1,400 that had more than one group working on um, And then the one that did have a lot, that is called climate, so a climate campaign. So obviously it's called a shared campaign. So the finding is that very few groups work together, and many groups run heaps of campaigns, even if they're entirely dependent just on volunteers to run them. So there's great capacity here for groups to work together a bit more on these campaigns. One thing that we're seeing changing over time, the last bit of my network section, is a move from where we've got the movement in the past, it's always been a group, and they might have lots of campaigns. Maybe another group works on a campaign, and they might have a few little subgroups. So, like Ron Wilson Climate Action Network group, my group, but I might have Nick's fabulous climate action group working with me, and Sarah's the most amazing climate action group working with me. And we might move on one campaign together. Right? So, that's quite normal. But what we've seen change here is the group becomes a campaign in the middle, and it's probably got paid, paid staff. So think of Stoppadani here as well. And then they have lots of other groups who buy into the campaign or they become a Stoppadani group. And those are called directed network campaigns. So let's have a look and see how these have changed over time. So this is what the movement looked like. Um, actually, got my little heading. Maybe I'll put that down here. So this was 1958 to 2010, all the groups that formed in that time. So we did have two good networks, transition and all the game. The next graph is all of those groups plus five years. So, 2015. Again, we had the transition time movement, lots of great, but we also had climate action network groups starting up. Now, wait for this. This was in the last seven years. So this is a radical growth in direct network campaign. Lock the gate suddenly started either getting or saying that they had a huge number of subgroups. Extension of value form, these are all the like XR, Canberra, XR, listening group, same stuff that I And some maybe you haven't heard of other, like more energy and coalition for community energy. So something about this network structure is working really well, but also it can be really difficult to maintain these structures. So my, oh, I forgot the next step on that one. I'll cover that next, but I'm really interested in looking at how direct network campaigns can actually be sustained over time given that almost all of the people involved in them are volunteers. So the outcome, last bit. 
So I mentioned before this idea of primary and secondary targets and different levels of success according to both. Dining combine activity is a really good indication. Again, the campaign's failed, but it had multiple successes within it. If we look at the types of groups here that were targeted by Stop Data Campaign, how many of them actually said they would stop working or funding a dining? You see, and then some of them you see that actually lots of them were really successful. 77% of the finance companies, banks and stuff, that were asked not to fund Adani said they would not fund Adani. Um, and even the coal haulage, one of them said they wouldn't. Probably other reasons. There's no claim of causation here. Of course, you can't work out causation on this at the moment. Um, but still quite impressive. They also were successful, another measure of success in growing those local groups. And they were also successful in establishing networks outside of Australia. So, one thing I have done is looked at the outcomes of climate change campaign and some conservation campaigns. But you may remember that I mentioned I'm up to 1,400 campaigns in my database. So what the problem is, is that it takes about 10 minutes for me to go and work out the outcome of a campaign because I need to look online to see if it's been achieved. And in that 10 minutes, it feels like three or four more campaigns have started. <laughs> so. I've never been able to get to the end of my database on working out the outcomes of campaign. But this, these climate ones were the climate change campaigns I found in 2017. And then I looked 18 months later to see if they had succeeded in achieving their goals. Some of the goals were, um, I think the Climate and Health Alliance wanted the Victorian government to bring in a strategy about climate and health legislated. And that was achieved. So that's an example of a goal. Many of the other ones said, uh, we want Australians to reduce climate emissions. That was not achieved, that's unsuccessful. So I had to go through them all and I look at the targets. What we see here is the orange is successful, so the goal was achieved, and the yellow is partially. And we looked at the one that had the most full and partial success were the campaigns that targeted businesses. Now that's just coming through all my data quite commonly, even though we tend to think that the environment can move and targets policymakers or politicians, when it targets businesses, it can be likely to be more successful. Why is that? Because business is really susceptible to reputational damage uh, and financial incentives, but I think more than anything else, reputational damage. So the other thing I've looked at is which ones are more successful by issue, and these are conservation campaigns. So the conservation campaigns which had the highest degree of success, really surprising me for me, really surprising me was one targeting development. So that's like uh, there's a local piece of bushland down the road and someone wants to chop all the trees down and build a, um, an apartment complex. Uh, and so actually more than half, almost two thirds of those are successful, which I found really crazy because what we tend to get in the news are the ones that are not successful. You know, the really outrageous ones that are going ahead and everybody's trying to stop it and they don't stop. But behind the scenes, there's a lot going on that's successful. And again, with our conservation campaigns, the businesses here, um, yellow success, ones that target business, again, have pretty high rate of success, either full or partial success. Now, the very last bit I want to work on is that not only does the media respond to environmental movement, not only do the public look at it and, um, and people reflect on it, but of course the government has a view on, uh, particularly on civil resistance. And I don't think you have trouble here at ACT, but New South Wales, Victoria, other places, there has been really repressive legislation brought in. So I wanted to know, was there a pattern between the number of people arrested for climate change and the type of responses that the government made to that protest? So we can see big number of arrests and credit. This is very messy data, by the way. You know, no publicly available database on arrests in Australia. But anyway, we see a big peak in arrests. And then also, um, that's just some examples, but we also see a big peak in government responses. Government responses are things like um, bringing an act protest law. They're also with examples of extinguishing that title over areas that First Nations people are trying to stop resource extraction happening on. And little things like, Brisbane City Council stopping extinction rebellion from using their facilities. So you can see peak and arrest, peak and government responses, but has protests 
stop. Oh, I don't think it hit. Uh, so next step. Okay, so I'll be working on Big's discovery project. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to put some other stuff going on as well. I have some projects on the go with some environmental groups looking at making the whole movement because when you know what's going on in the movement, groups in it can then try to work together more, try to work out where the gaps are. It's a big project. Uh, also, this is Big's discovery project, Big's again, communication channels, and how people respond to people who are not stereotypical activists. Very interested in that because also this media focus on stereotypes. And so, if we could just move away from that, it's very powerful to show that much more people actually want action. And I think that really corresponds to next groups as well. Like, who's missing your ears and how it's framed? Um, I really wanted to check that the campaign outcome mentioned that before. Anybody wants to help me, <laughs> let me know. And then a uh, bunch of projects for environmental groups. Part of the problem of research on environmental activism is that very little of it is accessible to activists. So all of the stuff I do, I try to put on the Common Social Change Library, which is Australia's only library that is fully accessible to everybody. And I really encourage all of you who are academic, writing research papers, to take your paper, Put it in a three, four, five hundred word article, link to it, your paper, stick it on the common. Honestly, you get way more readership and you're making it accessible to people who might use it. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. That was quite the walkthrough and incredible <laughs> amount of data and insight. So yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share because this will allow us to see everybody online. Wow. Okay, hello everybody online. So now we've got a little bit of time. Michelle, now we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, and how much time precisely? I'm not sure because my watch went flat. Okay, 25 minutes. So we've got a bit of time for a few. So from the room and from online. John, it looks like you would like to ask a question. <coughs> Can I trouble you to come up to here so that your voice uh, is heard by the people in line? Um, <coughs> okay. Um, thanks, Robin, for interesting. Um, Can you hear me online, people? Thanks for interesting yeah. presentation. Um, yeah, there's lots of really interesting stuff there. A lot to unpack, actually. <laughs> um, just two things. I'm wondering whether, I, I guess the first thing is, does the fields and that kind of phenomena fit into your analysis? And uh, I guess uh, because that's been the big theme. And the second thing is, it's really nice to look at the micro level in terms of individual campaigns and outcomes. But I guess the broader question is the kind of political economy that's shaping our environment and whether cumulatively, I, know, I don't know how you would do this. Link, I'm not sure you thought about it. All these things that you're analyzing numerically which uh, shifts in the political economy that we buy. Yeah. Well uh, I'll answer the second one first because I've got the first one. Um, the second <laughs> one. <laughs> I think that, so there's been this huge amount of scholarship on social movement studies, right? Decades of it. Amazing theories um, that have been developed. And and sometimes you do, especially when I was doing my PhD, you think, well seriously, what have I got to add? But something that is really cool today is that we have this amazing amount of online data, right? And people who shape those theories of social movement change, political economy and like resource mobilization theory, things like that, they didn't have access to any data which could prove their theories. So my grand hope, I suppose, is that I just get enough data, because I you know, love data, that we can start then saying, well, you know, does this work, does this actually um, show that the political opportunity structure, a theory that defines how groups might perhaps create change in the political arena, does that actually work out when we put the data in the model? Um, and I've started doing that a little bit with resource mobilisation theory because it's the easiest one. So I look at the, the money that groups have, the staff they have, the network connections they have, and then the theory is that groups with more of these resources are more likely to be able to affect change. So we put that data together with the campaign outcomes and we can say, okay, groups that do have staff are more likely to affect change. And you know, bingo, it shows some evidence for the theory. So that's the hope. Beyond that, I don't know whether it is easy in any way to apply this, this very micro the data to that macro perspective. Even trying to match up the micro data on the events and the campaigns sometimes is virtually impossible. Um, so, 
Yes. What was question one? Question one was how does the TEALS phenomena fit with your kind of analysis? Because that also is linked with the broader the bigger question that response, I think, is a, is a reaction to the way the political economy is tracing so it's dark. Mm -hmm. Was it for the, the, the deal that? Teals. Teals. Oh, the teals, yeah. Well, I think that actually probably responds more to the Beck's discovery project, <laughs> which is that in Nick's work, that they, they bypassed, so there was a really strong message with the teal independence that they are not associated in any way with activists. They're not associated in any way with any activist organization. And it was really, really important for their own um, <laughs> status. In the, in the electorate and um and so in a way i suppose it shows that the movement might be broader than we think but those people probably aren't in the movement because they don't identify with it i just think it shows changing times and what australians are willing to consider and who they're happy to listen to great yep. thank you thanks john thanks robin um any more from in the room or online uh, Libby, please go ahead. Oh, and then we'll come to you afterwards, Shell. Thank you. So Libby, then Shell. Hi. Um, thank you so much. That was um, really interesting and really enlightening. And um, I know we're going to chat next week, so I've got lots of questions for you. So it's great to have some information. I guess a, a quick question is um, in terms of the, you talked about there was all the number of organizations were any of them did you find that any of them were sort of specifically identified as indigenous or first nations um or was it um other groups or whatever that kind of had a mix of people yeah this is a really interesting um point as well so there was the slide i had with the massive blog and that was the networks of the groups and the um connections with businesses so there were some connections with indigenous organizations so when i get this data when i scrape this data i define a group as an indigenous group if they call themselves an indigenous group right so um there were some they were often um, either ranger groups or aboriginal land corporations that had ranger groups and they were often environmental groups such as conservancy, like the Tasmanian Land Conservancy, works directly with indigenous groups um, in partnership to manage land. So that happened a lot with some of the conservation type things. Beyond that, there's very, very few groups that are that would seem to define themselves as part of the movement while placing primacy on their identity as indigenous. And I can really only think of a couple, right? Seed, seed mob, and the First Nations Clean Energy Group, something like that. Um, and I think from my interview with activists, my experience with activists as well, this is a really big gap in the movement. And I know people are really trying to, trying to develop relationships in a way that's not really colonial in terms of the movement and this whole idea of advocacy. You know, when I advocate for something, I'm trying to convince people to do something different, right? That's pretty, that's pretty colonial. That's pretty, um, thanks, German. <laughs> thanks for coming along. <laughs> um, it's a really difficult thing to grapple with, and I think that's why there's, there is this huge disconnect. I have seen Libby um, as well for some of your work, and also um, someone I know up at, um, at Griffith really trying to grapple with these issues. I feel like the solutions to building more groups that have First Nations, um, that First Nations led is to um, obviously have First Nations people, they lead on it, right? Then it has to come not from this actually very predominantly white environmental movement. And the same actually for groups that might have a migrant background, refugee background. Um, this is all a problem with diversity and inclusion in the movement. It's also a problem with people with disabilities. So for example, I have a, I have a hidden disability, I can kind of get away with it, but how many people do you really see out there in the movement and environmental groups with visible disabilities, very, very few. So these are things that we all kind of need more research on and we need to work on as a movement. Thank you, Robin. And thanks, Libby, oh, sure. for the question. Yes, so Shell, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Robin. I really, um, really enjoyed your presentation. I actually came to, into my career from the environmental movement at AYCC and GetUp. So um, there's lots of interesting data. I think that a lot of those groups would find absolutely fascinating too. I had two um, questions. The first was, 
you know, in terms of your um, the way you charted the evolution, the evolution of, of those changing networks was, did you see what do you think sort of will be the next step? Do you see that is that evolution going to continue to progress? And then the second question I had was around, you know, um, ascribing sort of um, environmental outcomes to particular groups and causality. Because, um, you know, when I was in the movement, it was very hard to actually determine what impact you had actually had. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you had sort of dealt with, with that. Okay, I'll start with question two again because I've forgotten question one. So, <laughs> um, so question two, yes, no change of causation. And the way I try to overcome that, that very objective, you know, immutable fact is that if you had enough data, we have thousands of campaigns, we can ascertain correlations. And from correlations, we can start to talk about causation, right? Um, and then maybe you can bring in lots of qualitative data with, with activists saying, and, and policy makers or businesses asking who caused what. But look, it's going to be a problem for a long time. Um, in terms of the outcomes, so how can we, was it measure outcomes? How can we kind of, is that what the, yep. Um, can you repeat that bit, Shell? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So the first part, the first part was just um, around the like the evolution of the network. So do you do you think that the network structure of those groups is going to keep changing over time, or do you think that that was sort of a one-off kind of progression? Be interested to yeah hear your views. Yeah, I'm really torn about that, and that's actually because I was talking to someone last night about directed network structures, and um, and there you know there's a there's a push, we've had a bunch of surveys and projects done with different environmental groups asking them what do they feel like they need to do? And often they feel like they need to grow because it's what funders want. They want data showing they've got 10 new groups and they've got, you know, doing 100 actions. It's all about growth. And that is very capitalist, isn't it? And is it the right thing? Because when you grow, I don't know if you've been an activist or had experience, let's say you've been in a group, all of you have probably been in a group of some sort, and when there's sort of three and four of you, it's quite good, you know each other, you can talk. When your group goes to 10 or 20 people, you lose the relational aspect of it. And so I was talking to someone last night and she was saying, you know, we had some criticism of our direct network campaign that again, it's really colonial. It's saying, this is what we want. We want to achieve this outcome and we want your group to join us and we want you to do it this way. And, um, and we think that way is the best way. Obviously, they don't frame it like that, but it is kind of extractivist in a way. So her whole thing was like, are these, is growth what we need in the movement, or is it more relational stuff? Is it better for me and you, Shell, to just say, look, we really care about the environment, just the two of us will do stuff, and we'll have fun, and we'll be able to do it for years, or is it better to say, okay, we want everybody in the Zoom call, and Beck, and Nick, and Sierra, and we're just going to do heaps of stuff, and be really busy, and then it will burn out. So... I can't decide at the moment. <laughs> I think the direct and network structures are definitely the way funders want the movement to grow. Um, and again, we have to grapple with the issues of um, indigenous inclusion and that and volunteer burnout, you know, conflict within the movement, inability of the movement to network together effectively, and then try to think. I actually have a colleague who's just finishing a PhD and she does prefigurative work. So like thinking of the, the vision of the society that you want in the future and making it happen now. Maybe that's what we need more of in the movement. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for coming up, Sarah. <laughs> thanks, Robin, that was amazing. And that's a perfect segue into my question, which was, so they've had, the groups have had the most success kind of, you know, with kind of local, don't develop this area, protect this this land and with businesses because of that public reputation. I guess I wondered your observations, both about the degree to which they're moving into other potential areas of impact and their likely success in kind of switching and the prefigurative movements yeah. to things like people's consumption behaviours. Um, do you see them moving them in that direction and do you think they have the right toolkits for that? Yeah, I think that the movement, if I'm making a massive generalisation, is going right away from private environmental behaviours, and um, and that is probably from an acceptance that the urgency of the crisis is so great that changing private environmental behaviours is effectively meaningless for a movement to advocate for. So they want to advocate for systemic change, but at the same time, this problem about growth and the problem about you know is the movement just replicating all the things that are wrong with our society now? You know, how can we actually solve the issue if that's what's happening? It means that more groups are, I think, really thinking about how can we make this relationship building? And 
One cool example, I, I was able to evaluate the Climate Action Network Australia Small Grants Program. So they give groups $5,000 to $10,000 every, every half year, I think. Uh, local groups to do stuff in their own community about climate, but with no real um, parameters around it. And it had to include some element of climate justice. And what I thought was really cool with that was some of the projects were kind of prefigurative. They were, they were saying, we're not going to hold a rally, we're not going to do a protest, we're not going to ask some business to go, you know, go do something else somewhere else. We're going to make our community and we're going to um, get people together and we're all going to learn about the plants of this area and make a new garden and get kids to come in and learn about it and work with the school. So maybe not the traditional type of activism that I researched. The other problem with the private program into behaviour, Sarah, is that it's a data problem I hear. Yeah. So a lot of campaigns, some that some of them do say reduce plastics. There's a heap of campaigns about reducing plastic use, but the problem is you can't measure the outcome. It's, there's no data, and these groups often don't say, "Here's our new campaign. We want everybody in Canberra to use this plastic, and we're going to measure the outcomes by tracking, you know, the waste and the dump trucks in six months." They don't say that this is not a skill that the environmental movement by and large has. So instead, all I can say is that that campaign, Reduce Plastic Waste, is targeted at individuals and it's unable to measure whether it's successful in any way. I think it's a massive problem for research on private pro environmental behaviours. Um, and so, because we don't know the outcomes, we can't actually see how they slot together with collective action either. We do know that if you're involved in activism, you're really likely to be doing all the private prime mind interviews you can do, right? Not vice versa. But but how much does that actually change things? We don't know. <laughs> hey Rob, thank you for the talk. It's so good. It took so many notes. So oh, good. good. I just have a couple of ones. Quick one, first one on the um, slide that was talking about the activities of information sharing. And yes. the one was eco activists, wondered what, what that was. Um, and then uh, the second question. Oh, um, gosh, can I ask? Answer yeah, go yeah. <laughs> So, eco activities was a little bit hard to find, but anything kind of physical. So, clean ups, heaps of groups do clean ups tree planting, weed removal, um, anything that involves people doing something physical on the land. Okay, cool. Thank you. And the second one is, you're probably going to answer this through the Best Discovery Project. Oh, which is well, the that's the next project. <laughs> <laughs> the pre-post um, COVID stuff. Because yes. I'm wondering, right, when, when there were like lockdowns and things, and some people like, oh, look what happens when humans don't interact with the environment, emissions go down. But then we know that they went straight back up once that yeah. stopped. And so I'm wondering, it's kind of the opposite for social movements, right? It's like you need the prolonged engagement to keep people like momentum, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering what do you kind of expect you might find? Do you think there's going to be a, a sort of negative effect from people yeah. not being able to get out and engage and with, with the groups? Yeah, I think I'll find, because I have scraped most of the events, I'll find the same level of activity. So groups kept doing stuff, they just did it online, gotcha. but they didn't do protest things, right? But they, there was heaps of targeting businesses through like digital storms and ringing like uh, what they call phone jams, where you have like 10 people who just constantly ring Bill Shorten or, or um, you know, what's his name? Scott Morrison's um, phone. <laughs> so that kind of stuff, the home stuff. Um, so I will find the same amount of activity. Again, I can't, I can't link events to campaign outcomes. So it makes it really hard to see what's more effective. One area I think that was more effective with online was the inclusion. So lots of stuff I've seen on, the, on social media and in some of the interviews I've done is that when we all had to go online, people with access issues and with physical disabilities and um, you know had kids to look after or uh, financial concerns that they couldn't have, or suddenly they could participate in the movement, like a massive change. I don't know if that's going to continue though. So um, I think it would be quite cool to look at how the messaging changed because, you know, all the, the data about the media showing that they were so anti the Extinction Rebellion because it's physical and you get great pictures. Well, did, did Extinction Rebellion or the groups that involve, engage in civil resistance sort of take a learning maybe from the, from the COVID and say, well, hey, maybe we need to frame this in a different way? Um, because there was very little negative media coverage of environmental activism during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. I can't think of any. 
So I'd like to see how those frames shape over time. Maybe you could help. You have pictures, Thanks, Robin. Right. Thanks, Nick. Um, so, folks that are online, and also Sarah and Nick, if you have more questions, please feel welcome. So, if you're online and you'd like to ask a question, please let us know. But in the brief um, opportunity, I might put a question to you, Robin, that's oh, actually yeah. related. <laughs> Sorry. You all just got that. Yeah. No, specifically not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with that media stuff that you were just referring to, then the coloured bubbles that were really interesting. Have you, could you just talk a little bit about how you feel that media coverage contributes to or maybe hinders the success? Like just any yeah. insights that you've got from your research or practice? Yeah, I think this does really relate to your discovery project. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose I feel like sometimes it's hard because you see a protest and you just see how the protest would look from the eyes of someone say in the right wing media and you, and I just feel really depressed because it's so easy to stereotype. Mm -hmm. And um, and I have been involved in protests in Brisbane, not the greatest left wing media in Brisbane, where the coverage of that protest was entirely the opposite of what the protest was actually about. So I think sometimes, in a way, um, it's it, when you're at the protest, you think, okay, well, I'm at this protest that I'm asking this politician to do something and, and it's clear what the message is that I have. There's 20 of us here and that politician will listen. That's great. It's easy to forget that there's 50,000 people who are going to read the newspaper article about you and think, I hate those people. Mm -hmm. I'm not like that person. I would never do that. So I actually think media coverage can be really, really detrimental. I haven't seen many examples of where... Well, I feel like I haven't seen many examples where it's helped the environmental movement mm -hmm. in a way, especially with the unconventional stuff. Sometimes um, I think it's far better when these groups totally avoid media coverage. And it is something I think doctors and uh, the social workers, as children's books, writers for climate action, they will probably do everything they can to avoid media coverage. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when I was working in Hong Kong, this whole thing about stereotyping just wasn't, didn't seem to be an issue. Whereas I think it's a massive issue here. I don't know if it's something you feel as well, but we, the media does seem so prone. <laughs> it's so easy, right? Mm -hmm. When I was looking at this, the coverage of Extinction Rebellion in 2019, some of the language used was like um, slime, feral. I think one of the guys got called a Nazi. Um, this, this is not helpful for anyone. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Robin. So um, now might be a good chance to look through the chat, although I think they were all no, no, people no. saying how wonderful you are rather than asking questions. If you are still here, you can always email me as well. Um, and I really would love to hear of research that you're doing or if you're interested in the years. I do, I have a lot of data. I don't have capacity to analyse it all, but I'm really happy to share it as well. So if it's something that interests you. Um, especially this massive amount of website data, then you can, you know, I'm really happy to share and work with you on it. So, Libby, you have a question about the phone. Oh, that's only the terrible question. <laughs> <laughs> Was it just how do you define them? Um, yeah, sorry. It, um, I, I, I guess it's that thing that I've been reading and I guess struggling with in terms of looking at the context of water contestation in the Northern Territory. And a lot of the reading that I've done, and I need to do a lot more, um, about social movements just doesn't necessarily seem to fit what I can see or what I'm wanting to look at. And I think it's that, um, just that notion of collective action potentially. And for me, the need to also look at, um, I guess, sort of smaller, random acts of, you know, defiance or resistance or whatever. And I so, although it's something that I need to look at and I need to unpack a bit, I, I, I don't know the best definition really that's going to suit what I'm looking at. And I don't know if the word social movements defines what I'm going to look at. So I guess I'm just looking at, you know, yeah. How do you define it and how is the idea, I guess, the individual versus collective? Like if it's if there's something that's predominantly scattered individual acts and it's a bit random and not coordinated, is that 
how do you look at that in terms of defining that as a social movement? I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I suppose um, I don't. I don't think there's an answer to it, and it really depends what discipline you're in as well. Yeah. Um, so what the definition is. But I, I suppose my approach is always to, to just take what people say at face value. So, um, for example, if some if a group says they're in the movement, they're in the movement. Boom, done. <laughs> Otherwise, I use those three points that um, I mentioned earlier. They have to identify in some way. They have to have. Um, network connections, and then there was a third one that's currently escaped me. <laughs> um, there was three points on the slide anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, and if they have those, it's in the movement. The other thing I have learned, okay, because I think it is a really, um, I keep using that word colonial, but I think the way we define movements is, is quite, um, Maybe, maybe old fashioned, I don't know. It doesn't include these different ways of doing things and different ways of building our communities. You have to either say, okay, well, I wanna choose a definition that includes what I think these groups are doing and they're in the movement, or saying they're not in the movement, they're doing something different. That's not a bad thing. And I had this trouble with the transition town groups because transition groups are trying to um, create in their local communities the way that they wanna live post climate crisis, right? local economy stuff um is that are they are they in the movement or not i don't know i really thought about it for a long time and i put them in the movement someone else will not put them in the movement so in a way i kind of feel like maybe it's better not to get hung up on it or just to say the groups that you're looking at are doing something really new and exciting and we will need to change our definition of the movement in the future to accommodate them that's all right. And then you can write a paper on it and everybody else can cite you. And then we'll all be like me feeling really happy that we can actually have someone to cite who's saying this really good point. Because, <laughs> you know, it's really hard when you want to argue something and no one else has, no one's actually got it in a public paper. And then <laughs> reviewers come back and say, oh, there's some young academic, well, early career academic and that's just crap. <laughs> that's so many times. Sorry. Thanks. Oh, I could do a whole presentation on the review of comments up there. Maybe that could be a like group therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, I think that's a good time to draw it to a close. So, thanks to everybody who's joined online, in person, and special thanks to Robin for such a thought provoking and engaging presentation. Thank Most you. Important. And I should also say many thanks to Kat and Rini who look after the seminar series. So thank you very much for making this happen. We turned up, um, but there was heaps of work behind the scenes to get us all organized. Thank you for that. Okay. Thanks everybody. See you later.